Pediatrics Part 3. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the common respiratory emergencies experienced by pediatric patients. We'll also talk about some of the common treatments that paramedics would provide for these respiratory emergencies. Respiratory emergencies are frequently encountered in the field. You will frequently encounter respiratory problems in children who range from mildly ill to near death. In pediatrics, respiratory failure and arrest precede the majority of cardiopulmonary arrest. By contrast, a primary cardiac event is a usual cause of sudden death in adult. Early identification intervention can stop the progression from respiratory distress to cardiopulmonary failure and help to avert much pediatric morbidity and mortality. A couple of key points to remember here. The entire tracheobronchial tree of a child is smaller than that of an adult. So even small amounts of swelling or bronchospasm are much more significant to the same amount of narrowing in an adult's airway. And pediatric patients are more prone to airway obstruction. It's important to remember infants have limited ability to compensate for respiratory insults and are often expend huge amounts of energy to breathe. Older children have developed compensatory skills so they can compensate for days with adequate oxygen saturation. Many infants and children with respiratory conditions, they'll experience respiratory distress, which is difficulty breathing, respiratory failure, which invariably leads to decompensation and respiratory arrest. It's very important to remember that respiratory distress, if not treated quickly, will lead to respiratory failure. Respiratory failure, if not aggressively managed, will most definitely lead to respiratory arrest. And then respiratory arrest will lead to cardiac arrest. In the cases of critical ill patients, uh, pediatric, critically ill cr pediatric patients, you need to figure out if there is a pediatric specific emergency department available for transport and consult medical direction for your local transport protocols for advice. You've got to first determine the severity. Is a child in distress, failure, or arrest? And the aggressiveness of your treatment is going to depend on that. Keep your anatomic and physiologic respiratory differences in mind as well. The respiratory distress entails increased work of breathing to maintain oxygenation and or ventilation. This is a compensated state in which increased work of breathing results in adequate pulmonary gas exchange. This can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Signs of respiratory distress include pallor or moderate propeller, irritability, anxiety, restlessness, respiratory rate faster than normal for the pediatric patient's age, retractions, abdominal breathing, nasal flaring, inspiratory stridor, grunting, and mild tachycardia. Respiratory failure means the patient can no longer compensate for underlying pathologic or anatomic problem by increased work of breathing. Hypoxia and CO2 retention is going to occur. And signs for a patient in respiratory failure are going to include decreased or absent retractions due to chest wall muscle fatigue, altered mental status due to inadequate oxygenation and ventilation of the brain, and abnormally low respiratory rate. This is a decompensated state and requires urgent intervention to the point to where you're probably going to have to assist ventilations if tidal volume and respiratory effort is inadequate. You do not want the pediatric patient to progress into respiratory arrest because this is where the patient is not breathing spontaneously. You are going to have to manage ventilations with back mass ventilations, and this may be to the point to where you would have to consider resuscitation efforts or you will have to consider resuscitation efforts. Determining the severity of the illness will indicate urgency of treatment and transport. You need to know your signs of impending respiratory failure, which include mental status, skin color, respiratory rate, effort, auscultation, blood oxygen saturation, and pulse rate. Respiratory distress is most common with respiratory distress typically requires only supportive care. However, if the patient becomes fatigued, distress may very quickly progress to failure. Young children may become agitated with nasal cannula or face mask. Crying and thrashing increase metabolic demands and oxygen consumption. You need to weigh the benefits of oxygen administration against the potential call. If you do feel like it is necessary to give oxygen, then you may want to consider blow-by technique and allow a caregiver to do this. As the child becomes fatigued, you may start seeing changes that will indicate respiratory failure. Significant changes or trends requires prompt attention and reassess frequently to evaluate the effects of the treatment. With this patient, you want to have them on ECG monitoring. You would want to have IV access 
and continually manage the airway. Foreign body aspiration or obstruction. Infants and toddlers have a high risk of foreign body aspiration. You've got mild obstruction where you're still going to have air movement and then severe obstruction where there is no air movement and the air has completely been blocked off. If you note a foreign body in a responsive infant, you can deliver five back slaps and five chest thrusts. For unresponsive infants, if the infant loses consciousness, you want to start CPR in the presence of a foreign body. Perform 30 chest compressions. Look inside the mouth and remove the object if it's seen. Continue with compressions and ventilations and assess repulse. For children, you want to try to perform the Heimlich maneuver, bigger children. If the child becomes unresponsive, you want to position them supine, perform 30 chest compressions, look inside the mouth and remove the object, and then proceed with laryngoscopy and removal with McGill forceps. Anaphylaxis is a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction triggered by an exposure to an antigen. Several different types of triggers may occur, but food, especially nuts, shellfish, eggs, and milk are common, and bee stings are among the most common causes. It can also occur with certain antibiotics and other medications. Exposure to the antigen stimulates the release of histamine and other vasoactive chemical mediators from white blood cells, leading to the multiple organ system involvement. Onset of symptoms generally occurs immediately after exposure, which may include hives, respiratory distress, circulatory compromise, and GI symptoms, which includes vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Mild anaphylaxis. The child may experience only hives and some wheezing, and in severe anaphylaxis, the child may be in respiratory failure and shock when you arrive. Your pediatric assessment triangle may also reveal an anxious child. In severe anaphylaxis, the child may be unresponsive due to respiratory failure and shock. They may have increased work of breathing due to upper airway edema or bronchospasm and poor circulation. Other findings may include swelling of the lips and oral mucosa, strider and or wheezing. If the child has a known allergy, the sample history may reveal recent contact with or ingestion of the potentially offending agent. Treatment of anaphylaxis should include the gold standard for treatment, which is epinephrine. Epinephrine is a non-selective adrenergic agonist with, in this case, it locks onto the alpha adrenergic receptors. And if it's Alpha agonist effect decreases airway edema by vasoconstriction and improves circulation by increasing peripheral vascular resistance. Its beta agonist effects cause bronchodilation, resulting in improved oxygenation and ventilation. It should be given by the intramuscular route, and the dose may be repeated as necessary every 5 to 15 minutes. If several doses are needed, the child may require a continuous IV epidrip. In addition to epinephrine treatment, of anaphylaxis should also include supplemental oxygen, fluid resuscitation for shock, diphenhydramine or Benadryl only after epinephrine has been given, and bronchodilators can be considered as well. Many children with a history of anaphylaxis will have been treated with IM epi by a caregiver before EMS activation. Given the short half-life of epinephrine, the child should be transported even if asymptomatic on your arrival. The group is a viral infection of the upper airway. The virus is transmitted by respiratory secretions, and it primarily affects children between the ages of 6 months to 6 years. Most cases occur in fall and winter. The virus has an affinity for the subglottic space, which is the narrowest part of the pediatric airway and causes edema and progressive airway obstruction. Turbulent airflow through the narrowed subglottic airway causes a hallmark sign of croup, which is strider. Sample history usually reveals several days of cold symptoms and low-grade fever, followed by barky cough, strider, and trouble breathing. The cough and respiratory distress are often worse at night. Severity ranges from mild to severe. A mild would be absence of strider at rest, minimal respiratory distress, and an occasional cough. Moderate would be a behavior and mental status or normal, but inspiratory strider and retractions are present at rest, and the amount of respiratory distress is increased. And severe mental status changes are present accompanied by significant respiratory distress and decreasing air entry. This indicates impending respiratory failure. This is an example of what the barky cow cough would sound like. So management 
of a croup patient would be placing the child in a position of comfort, avoid agitating the child. The use of humidified oxygen or mist therapy is not indicated. A steroid such as dexamethasone may be administered IV or IM to reduce inflammation. Nebulized epinephrine is a treatment of choice with any of the following. Strider at rest, moderate to severe respiratory distress, poor air exchange, hypoxia, or altered appearance. Nebulized epinephrine works by causing vasoconstriction and decreasing upper airway edema. It's available in two formulations. You have racemic epinephrine and L-epinephrine. Although only a small amount is absorbed via the nebulized route, adverse effects may include tachycardia, agitation, tremor, and vomiting. Nebulized epinephrine alone may not be adequate, and you may have to consider assistive ventilations with bag mass ventilation. It will often overcome upper airway obstruction. Advanced airway placement is rarely needed. If performed, choose an ET tube one half to one size smaller than the normal for age or size to accommodate the subglottic edema. Children requiring nebulized epinephrine or assistive ventilation need to be transported immediately. Nebulized epinephrine will be five milliliters of a one to 10,000 solution. It would be a 2.25% solution or a 0.05 milliliter per kilogram with a max of 0.5 milliliters diluted in three milliliters in normal saline. Epiglottitis is inflammation of the epiglottis and supraglottic tissues. Hallmark presentation would be a sick, anxious child sitting in the sniffing position, drooling, increased work of breathing, pallor, cyanosis, and a history will reveal a sudden onset of high fever and sore throat. But with epiglottitis, the pus filled flap of the tissue partially or completely occludes the glottic opening and it can affect any age group, but most prevalent in two to seven years old. The incidence of epiglottitis has fallen sharply due to routine administration of the H influenza type B vaccine to children. The symptoms of epiglottitis progress rapidly. Children are generally sick for only a few hours before they come to medical attention. Ask about immunizations if you suspect epiglottitis. Your goal is to get the child to an appropriate facility with a maintainable airway. Risk for acute airway obstruction and respiratory arrest, so minimize on-scene time and do not attempt procedures that might agitate the child. Allow the patient to assume a position of comfort. Provide supplemental oxygen only if tolerated. Do not attempt to look in the mouth or insert an IV line because this can agitate the child and worsen his or her respiratory distress. Be prepared with a BVM and an ET tube, one to two sizes smaller than anticipated in the event of complete obstruction during transport. ET intubation is difficult because of the extreme distortion of the airway anatomy and should be used only as a last resort. Bacterial tracheitis is an acute bacterial infection of the subglottic area of the upper airway, complete or complicated by copious thick pus-filled secretions. Typically presents with cough, strider, and respiratory distress of varying degrees with a history of a preceding viral infection. Toddlers are at increased risk of complications due to their relatively narrow airway diameter and may present an extremis. Patients are often febrile and may prefer the sniffing position. You want to place in a position of comfort, provide supplemental oxygen is tolerated. Do not look in the mouth. This can precipitate complete airway obstruction. Do not insert an IV line. Try to keep the patient as calm and comfortable as possible and have a bag mask device, ET tube, one to two sizes smaller than anticipated. Alert the receiving facility of the potential need to intubate a difficult airway. Asthma is the most common chronic childhood illness with your main components of asthma being bronchospasm, mucus production, and airway inflammation. It involves the upper airway and involves restriction of airflow into the lungs. It involves the lower airway, which involves restriction of airflow out of the lungs. The incidence and mortality of this disease are increasing. Even infants can have reactive airway disease caused by specific triggers. As obstruction becomes more severe, the following will occur. Air trapping, inadequate ventilation, worsening of hypoxemia, hypoventilation with respiratory acidosis, and in this case, respiratory failure becomes imminent. Triggers for asthma attack include upper respiratory infection, environmental allergies, exposure to cold, changes in the weather, secondhand smoke, and clinical signs include frequent cough, wheezing, and more general signs of respiratory distress. The primary survey will vary based on the degree of obstruction and the presence or absence of respiratory fatigue. Mild to moderate respiratory distress, the child will be awake and alert, sometimes preferring a seated posture. 
Although increased work of breathing may be evident by retractions and nasal flaring, circulation will seem normal. Signs of severe respiratory distress and impending respiratory failure include decreasing alertness, tripod positioning, deep retractions, and cyanosis. A primary survey will reveal shortness of breath as evidenced by the following. Inability to speak in full sentences, increased respiratory rate, prolonged expiration phase, and wheezes noted on auscultation. Expiratory wheezing alone may be heard with mild to moderate asthma attacks. Wheezing may be heard on inspiration and expiration with moderate to severe disease. Decreased air movement and the absence of wheezes suggest severe lower airway obstruction and respiratory fatigue. Immediate treatment is needed to prevent respiratory arrest. The sample history should reveal the frequency and severity of previous asthma attacks as reflected by ED visits and hospitalizations. While taking the patient's history, keep in mind factors that increase the risk of asthma-related deaths, a history of near-fatal asthma requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation, hospitalization or an emergency care visit for asthma in the past year, currently using or having recently stopped using oral corticosteroids, not currently using inhaled corticosteroids, overuse of short-acting beta agonists, poor adherence with asthma medications, and food allergies in a patient with asthma. Medication history should identify any preventative treatment and any rescue medications administered by the caregiver before your arrival. Inhaled steroids are the most common controller medications. Inhaled albuterol is the most common beta-2 agonist drug used as a rescue medication. For management, you want to place the patient in a position of comfort, provide supplemental oxygen. The gold standard of treatment for asthmatic patients would be bronchodilators. Beta agonists that relax smooth muscle in the bronchioles, decreasing bronchospasm and improving air movement and oxygenation. Listen to breath sounds before and after administration to assess the child's response to treatment. Bronchodilators may be delivered by nebulizer or meter dose inhaler with a spacer mass device. Unit doses of 2.5 milligrams of albuterol are premixed with 3 milliliters of normal saline. This is often used for nebulization. Acceptable starting dose for most young children. For a larger child or a child of any age who is in severe distress, consider 5 milligrams of albuterol as the initial dose. Children with moderate to severe respiratory distress can be given treatments as often as needed during transport, including back-to-back -back nebulizer treatments. Although albuterol is relatively safe, potential side effects include tachycardia, tremors, and mild hyperactivity. An isomer of albuterol, Leva albuterol, reportedly has fewer adverse effects. Children with moderate to severe respiratory distress may also benefit from inhaled ipotropium and anticholinergic bronchodilator. Studies have shown that the combination of albuterol and ipotropium, which may be mixed and delivered together by nebulizer, is more effective than albuterol given alone. The dose of ipotropium is given based on the patient's weight. For less than 10 kilograms or 22 pounds, a 0.25 milligram unit dose nebulized or one puff by MDI, or more than 10 kilograms or 22 pounds, 0.5 milligram unit dose nebulized or two puffs by MDI. IM dexamethasone at 0.6 milligrams per kilogram with a max dose of 16 milligrams given early, particularly within the first hour of presentation, can shorten the acute exacerbations of asthma and prevent or shorten hospitalizations. If the child is in severe respiratory distress, has an altered mental status, or has markedly diminished air movement on auscultation, a dose of epinephrine may be required. This will cause immediate relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscles, opening the airways to allow bronchodilators to work. This dose is 0.01 milligrams per kilogram of a 1 milligram per milliliter injected IM. Single doses should not exceed 0.3 milligrams. Initiate bronchodilator therapy immediately after administering the epinephrine. Assisted ventilation is problematic for patients with an asthma exacerbation because high inspiratory pressures force air into the lungs, but exhalation is compromised by bronchospasm, mucus production, and inflammation. This leads to air trapping and a high risk of pneumothorax and cardiovascular collapse. This should be undertaken only if the patient has respiratory failure and has failed to respond to IM epinephrine and high-dose bronchodilators. If performed, use slow rates to allow time for adequate exhalation. The goal is adequate oxygenation. RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. It is a common and contagious virus that causes bronchiolitis and pneumonia in children. It can be transmitted via direct contact with large droplets or indirect contact. The virus spreads in the hospital environment and in the community. 
In the community setting, outbreaks generally occur in late fall, winter, and early spring by direct contact with large droplets, which do not travel more than three feet, or by indirect contact with contaminated hands or contaminated items transmission may occur. Early signs and symptoms include sneezing, runny nose, nasal congestion, cough, and fever. It's going to be very important for you to consider PPE and wear the appropriate PPE because even though you may not have uh, extreme signs and symptoms as an adult, you can easily pass it to a child. Post-transport vehicle cleaning is going to be important and post-exposure treatment is typically supportive. Bronchiolitis is inflammation or swelling of the small airways in the lower respiratory tract due to a viral infection. Most common source is RSV, also a newer virus, metanemovirus, and some other respiratory viruses also can cause bronchiolitis. You'll see the higher, highest frequency in winter and primarily affects infants and children younger than two years. It's highly contagious and the severity ranges from mild to moderate respiratory distress with hypoxia and respiratory failure. Younger infants are at particularly high risk for episodes of apnea associated with RSV infection, which may not be associated with severe respiratory distress. Signs and symptoms can be difficult to distinguish from those of asthma. One clue is age. Asthma is rare in children younger than one year. An infant with a first-time wheezing episode in late fall or winter it likely has bronchiolitis. This is an example of a pediatric patient with severe respiratory distress. Because of the physiology of this disease process, the child is in danger of respiratory failure and requires immediate transport, especially in the following cases. They're real sleepy, they're experiencing severe retractions, diminished breath sounds, moderate to severe hypoxia, and they're at the greatest risk for respiratory failure and arrest in infants with the following characteristics. First months of life, history of prematurity, underlying lung disease, congenital heart disease, or immunodeficiency. Management is supportive, position of comfort, supplemental oxygen, and suction of thick nasal and oral secretions. Because bronchioles are usually too deep in the airway to be surrounded by any smooth muscle, aerosol bronchodilators rarely help. One definition of bronchiolitis is wheezing that is unresponsive to bronchodilators. Pneumonia is a common disease process that infects the lower airway and the lung. In pediatric patients, it is commonly seen in infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Often caused by a virus in infants and toddlers, and the incidence of bacterial pneumonia increases as children get older. Children with pneumonia typically have a recent history of cough or cold or a lower airway inf infection. Maintain a high index of suspicion when called for children with any drop in oxygen saturation, particularly when accompanied by a fever or abnormal breath sounds. Often pediatric patients will present with unusually rapid breathing or will breathe with grunting or wheezing sounds. Additional signs and symptoms include nasal flaring, tachypnea, crackles, chest pain, hypothermia, or fever. The patient may exhibit unilateral diminished breath sounds, assess worker breathing by observing for signs of accessory muscle use. Infants may not tolerate pneumonia as well as older children because of the increased oxygen demand and less reserve amount. The primary treatment is supportive, monitor airway and breathing status, Administer supplemental O2 if required and take standard precautions. Vascular access is generally not indicated in this situation. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is a highly contagious, potentially deadly disease caused by bacterium that is spread through respiratory droplets. It's less common in the United States due to vaccinations, though immunization rates have fallen. Typical signs and symptoms are similar to the common cold, coughing, sneezing, and a runny nose. Coughing becomes more severe and is characterized by a distinctive whoop sound heard during the inspiratory phase. The cough can be so severe that it can cause post-cough vomiting, conjunctival hemorrhage, and cyanotic hypoxia. In very young infants, pertussis can also present with apnea. Keep the airway patent and transport to the ED. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that affects respiratory and digestive system. The most common life-shortening hereditary disease among people of European descent. Chronic production of copious amounts of thick mucus in the respiratory and digestive tracts makes them susceptible to recurrent respiratory infections that require hospitalization. It requires a strict regimen of aerosol treatments, mucus management, and pulmonary exercise. Pediatric patients may present with tachypnea, chest pain and crackles. 
It may be difficult to separate acute exam findings from chronic disease. Assess work of breathing by observing for signs of accessory muscle usage, tachypnea, and nasal flaring. Provide supplemental oxygen as needed. Vascular access is generally not needed for cystic fibrosis. This concludes the pediatric respiratory emergencies portion of the pediatric lectures. If you have any questions, please contact me, Nick Ray at suscc.edu.